Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The Smoky Mountains are well known for beautiful sweeping mountain vistas and of course the American black bear. But did you know that the park is also known for its amazing biodiversity? There are over 130 known species of land snails in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They play an important role in the local ecosystems, both in life and death. As decomposers, they help break down living material on the forest floor. In death, their shells provide much needed calcium for other animals like birds that need the mineral for eggshell production. The book, Land Snails of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and Southern Appalachians, is your guide to finding out more about the land snails in the Smokies. Hope to see you in Great Smoky Mountains National Park real soon. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you on behalf of Humanities Tennessee to the Southern Festival of Books. And uh, I want to uh, particularly thank our key sponsors, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. This session is entitled Dreaming America. We have a panel of three authors and three books. And our first, um, we are going to read some, but I'm going to introduce the, the authors first. And um, I'll begin with Amra Shabich El Reyes. And she grew up in Bihać, Bosnia and Herzegovina. After surviving ethnic cleansing and more than 1,100 1, days under the Serbs' military siege, she immigrated to the United States in 1996. By December 1999, she earned a BA in economics from Brown University. Later, she obtained two master's degrees and a doctorate from Columbia University. Currently, she is a professor at Columbia University working on understanding how and why societies fall apart and what role education can play in rebuilding decimated countries. She has published extensively on education-related issues and has lectured around the world to adult and adolescent audiences. In her students' feedback, Amra is consistently praised as one of the most inspiring professors they have encountered throughout their uh, career. And um, our second guest, Stephanie Elizondo Greest is a globe trotting author from South Texas. Her books include the award winning memoirs Across the Block My Life in Moscow, Beijing, and Havana, and Mexican Enough My Life Between the Borderlines, and the best selling guidebook. 100 Places Every Woman Should Go. She has also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Believer, the Virginia Quarterly Review, and the Oxford American, and she edited the anthology Best Women's Travel Writing 2010. Her coverage of the Texas-Mexico border won a marvelous award for social justice reporting. A renowned public speaker, she is Assistant Professor of Creative Nonfiction at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And Sahar Mustafa is the daughter of Palestinian immigrants and inheritance she explores in her fiction. Her first novel, The Beauty of Your Face, was named a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, a Los Angeles Times United We Read selection, and one of Marie Claire's magazine's 2020 Best Fiction by Women. It is currently long listed for the Center for Fiction 2020 First Novel Prize. Her short story collection, Code of the West, 
was the winner of the 2016 Willow Books Fiction Award. Mustafa earned her MFA from Columbia College, Chicago, where she was the recipient of the David Friedman Award for Best Fiction. New City Magazine recently named her one of 2020's Lit 50, Those Who Really Book in Chicago. She writes and teaches outside of Chicago. And first, we would like to hear from today, Stephanie Elizondo Greist from her book entitled, how, how about it, Stephanie? <laughs> All the Agents and Saints. Just thank you. Yeah, Dispatches from the U.S. Borderland. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, just to give you a little bit of context for the excerpt I'm going to read, uh, this is a book that examines life in the U.S. borderlands, both the Texas-Mexico border, which is where I'm from, and the New York Canadian border, in particular, the Mohawk Nation of Akwesasne, uh, which is bisected by uh, both Ontario, Quebec, and the United States and Canada. And so I'm reading from a section called Code 500, and that is the terminology that is used when uh, an undocumented person is found um, on, on land. Uh, who has not made it in their journey, who died along the way. And uh, as you probably know, this is a major crisis that's happening along our southern border. Uh, there are regions of the section of the southern border that are essentially becoming a graveyard uh, for all of these uh, people who are, um, who, who are dying because of immigration policy. Um, so this takes place, I actually happen to be um, in the Sheriff's Department of Brooks County, Texas, when they received one of these phone calls. And I went out to assist on a body recovery. Just then, the undertaker arrives on the scene. He is an older man with a slender build. He carries a white bed sheet and walks right up to the woman's feet, sets down his parcels, and slides on a pair of blue rubber gloves. He briskly searches her pockets, inches from the beetle pit in her stomach. First, he finds some dollar bills, a 20, a five, and three ones. He piles these atop the woman's thigh. Next, he pulls out an LG cell phone and wipes it clean. Running his fingers along her bra line, he checks to see if anything is tucked inside, an ID maybe, a list of phone numbers, but there is nothing. Now comes the task of slipping the woman into the bag. He unfurls the bedsheet and lays it out beside her, although ultimately it must go beneath her. Carefully, he rolls the woman onto her side. That makes her scalp fall off. She has become a liquid. All of her is leaking and dripping. The undertaker catches her scalp and swiftly slides it back into place, as though assisting a lady with an errant wig. While the rest of us stand and stare, Davila bounds over to help. They push the sheet beneath her and roll her back on top. She's small, Davila announces, probably Guatemalan or Honduran. The two men swaddle her in the sheet and stuff her into the black body bag with golden zippers. Davila, the sheriff and the border patrol agent fan out 30 feet and scan the brush for approximately half a minute before heading back to their respective trucks. There is no evidence in sight. We leave behind only an empty water bottle and a host of beetles. No words are spoken. No rights are given. Over by the ford, Davila wipes the shoes on a patch of wisache. Gotta make sure there's no bodily fluid on me, because it'll stink, he explains. We notice the undertaker struggling with the gurney. Davila hurries over. Together, they prop it open, lay the body bag on top, strap it down, lift it up, and roll it into the back of the van. Davila introduces me to the undertaker. His name is Angel. I want to say how fitting and applaud his professional grace. But before I can speak, Davila tells him, I am a writer. Angel shakes his head. A lot of people write stories, he said. Nothing ever gets done. I hear this a lot. It never fails to shatter me. I usually brush it off with a self-deprecating remark and a smile. But there's just something about standing in the woods with a three-day dead woman in 95 degree heat that gives me the audacity to hope that maybe, just maybe, something will change this time. Congress will change, minds will change, policy will change, and a humane immigration law will finally be enacted. 
And although that hope vaporizes into idealistic mist before I can even articulate it, there makes a spark of hope that by virtue of being written about, this Code 500 might be remembered. That even if we never learn her name, or whether she's Guatemalan or Honduran, or for all we know, Chinese, this one member of the 34 who died before her and the 94 who will die after her in this single year, in this solitary county of this one state, could be memorialized inside of a story. And at the very least, I will remember her. This woman who hiked illegally through this ranch and got annihilated for it, I will remember what remained of her feet and of her face when I tried to fall asleep at night. Is it wrong and hell to pray that this counts as something getting done? I wish to say this. I wish to say all of this and a great deal more. But there is time only to feebly smile before Angel returns to the driver's seat where he removes a pair of badly soiled gloves. He already knows he'll be back tomorrow. And I, I will not. Thank you. Thank you, Amra. And now we'll hear from Amra Sabich Ares, and she will read from her book, The Cat I Never Named. Hello, everyone. Um, I am going to read from The Cat I Never Named, a true story of love, war, and survival. It is my true story as a Muslim girl uh, who was born and raised in Bosnia, but I was also born hated and ultimately survived the Bosnian genocide in early 1990s against all odds and with the help of a stray cat that I never named. So I'm going to read for you a brief opening to the cat I never named. The war didn't spring on me all at once. Instead, like a cat, it stalked me quietly. There might have been a rustle of leaves, a glint of golden eye, but like a mouse, I didn't believe it was there until it pounced. 1992, chapter one. Math, puzzles, logic, ciphers. My brain is still whirling from the battery of tests as I ride the train from Belgrade, Serbia, back home to Bihać, Bosnia. The tracks push westward, the setting sun gilding the hillsides. Families, mothers, children, patter and laugh, squall, scold and squeal, in a comfortable cacophony that lets me almost doze off. I'm sleepy from a long day of tests, and I will be lucky to get home by 1 a.m. A few stops later, the families get off, soldiers get on, and I realize with the sinking feeling that I will be lucky to get home at all. I lower my eyes at once as men stomp down the aisles. I don't have to look to know their Chetniks, the most vehement Serbian nationalists. They're dressed in black with weird tall hats. The men have beards, wild hair, and hate in their eyes for anyone who is not Serb. I saw them all over the streets of Belgrade, sneering and shouting at anyone they thought might be Muslim. Quoting Slobodan Milosevic's hateful speeches, aren't you afraid? I'd asked my cousin Jana. It's not a big deal, she replied with an indifferent shrug. People feel like they can just say anything these days. But when these soldiers inv invade my train, I fear that they will have far more than words for this lone teenage Muslim girl. Now let's hear from Sahara Mustafa and her book is entitled, The Beauty of Your Face. Sahar, can you hear me? Uh, you are muted right now. And so, so sorry about that. 
that's all right. Let's, <laughs> I thought, you got, I thought a, you got a moment. You got a moment head start. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I just wanted to say, so sorry about that. Um, I thought those um, passages before me were just uh, beautifully gutting. So thank you uh, both uh, for those. Um, the beauty of your face uh, begins when a white male shooter enters an Islamic American school right outside of Chicago. Uh, the principal, Afaf Rahman, uh, thinks that it's uh, firecrackers when, when the shooting begins because uh, the school is just constantly harassed in this predominantly white neighborhood uh, and then very quickly realizes that um, they are not firecrackers. So we are whisked back in time over the decades of Afaf's life and the chapters are interspersed with the point of view of the shooter. I'm going to read from 1976, when Afaf Rahman is 10 years old um, in Chicago, and uh, her sister, Nada, has disappeared. 22 days pass. Khalti Nisreen has gone back to her husband with the promise to return in a few days. Ammu Yahya came to the door to collect her. He didn't step inside, awkwardly apologizing to Baba. Ziyad and Amjad stop by in the evening when Baba is home, carrying Pyrex dishes full of mashi and kofta their wives have prepared. A few of the Arabiyat around the neighborhood also drop by to comfort Mama, bringing a thermos of Sanka, as though she is incapable of even brewing coffee. From a wire basket at the sink, they pull mugs that Afaf washes when she comes home from school, and between sips, the women shake their heads and suck their teeth. May Allah return her safely to you, Umm Majid. Afaf's friend Samira visits with her mother and they play outside while Samira's mother washes bowls and glasses and Mama sits at the kitchen table, sobbing. Where could she have gone? Samira asks Afaf. Her friend's dark hair is cut in a short straight bob. Last summer, she crashed her bike into a rusty fence and a broken chain link sliced off the tip of her pinky. Afaf never tires of studying it, begging her friend to let her touch the smooth scar tissue. It looks like someone bit it off. Ever since, Samira is no longer allowed to ride a bike. Afaf had overheard Samira's mother telling Mama about it. Shaifa, Shaifa, see what happens when you give a girl too much freedom in this country? She loses a finger. Luckily, it hasn't changed Mama's uh, mind about Afaf riding her bike. Afaf turns the knobs on her friend's Magna Doodle pad and shrugs her shoulders. I don't know where she went. They take turns drawing on the sketch pad, black grains assembling like ants beneath the screen. Afaf pulls a lever and Samira's fat rainbow and flowers disappear. She sketches a kitten with long whiskers. Afaf still desperately wishes for a pet, but Mama refuses to have any four-legged creatures in their home. They have a fish tank, but the novelty has quickly worn off. Afaf wants an animal to hold and cuddle. Feeding indifferent fish is like any other chore she's expected to do around the apartment. I guess the police would have found her if she was hiding, Samira speculates, laying her chin on Afaf's shoulder as she draws. Why would she be hiding, dummy? Afaf doesn't intend to be cruel, but she wants to escape any talk of Neda, at least for a little while. She turns a knob on the pad trying to join two arcs to form a heart, but it ends up looking like an uneven inverted triangle. A young detective working the case buzzes the apartment one evening. Baba offers the detective a chair in the kitchen and Afaf and Majid watch from the doorframe of their parents' bedroom. He is very young, ruddy cheeks and blue eyes. His thick blonde hair parted on the side gives him the appearance of a schoolboy, not a homicide investigator. Detective Harold Jones, he shows her father his badge and tucks it back into the pocket of his corduroy jacket. Someone phoned about a suspicious man near the old Union stockyard. His eyes dart between her parents. We investigated and, he turns toward Afaf and Majid. Yo lad, Baba says softly, go watch TV. They bolt to the front room and sit on the sofa bed. Afaf listens hard, catching parts of the detective's sentences. We investigated and a body, these photographs. Can you identify, Sior? A chair pushes back, Mama's low moaning. Are you sure it's not her, Mr. Rahman? Have any distinguishing marks? 
the moaning grows louder, then shuffling slippers. The bathroom door slams shut. Mama's vomiting becomes the only sound in the apartment. Afaf runs to the kitchen. The detective stands, gathering his photographs. Before he closes his folder, Afaf catches the image of an arm, badly bruised, and fingernails caked with dirt. I'm sorry about all this, he tells Baba. You should take comfort in the fact that she's still out there. We'll do our best to find her. The dead girl in the pictures turns out to be Bianca Lopez, 16 years old, gone missing a day before Nada. Afaf knows that it is almost worse for her parents, it not being Nada's body battered and broken, because it means more waiting, more not knowing. Thank you. Thank you all for those wonderful readings. Uh, I don't think that uh, one can hear that and be unaffected. Um, at this time, I want to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that you are able to ask questions. And so they will be relayed to us and we will uh, answer them for you. So while you are while you are thinking about your questions, I want to propose that in all three of these novels, or all three of these books, they're not novels, there's a current thread, there's a common thread. And in fact, there are two. One of those is otherness, and the other one is hatred. How is the hatred that you see today in our country different from or similar to hatred that you write about? And Zahar, let's start with you. Mm. Uh, well, you know, my, my story is centered on, on Islamophobia and the hatred that exists because of bigotry in this country. So um, I felt, um, you know, inspired to write this after the real life killings of three Muslim Americans in North Carolina that happened in 2015. That's Yusur Abu Salha, um, who I reference in the epigraph um, of my book, her husband and, and her sister in cold blood by their white neighbor. Uh, so yeah, I, I am, am very much immersed, um, you know, in that in that hatred in this book, and it was just really important for me. You know, I start in the present, and and I think people uh, might be um, a little hesitant to pick up this book because they imagine that it's going to be incredibly graphic, uh, and then they realize, okay, you know, actually we're going on a journey of of this one young woman um, who, before she comes face to face with the shooter. Um, you know, we, we get to see what um, all the microaggressive behavior, all the bigotry that that she's grown up with has has shaped her and has also shaped this journey that she takes to Islam. Uh, so I was I was really interested in not just presenting sort of this, you know, sensationalized um, event. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, I was presenting um, I, what I hope is a new narrative and, and in that respect, sort of dispelling some of the, the ideas um, and stereotypes surrounding uh, the Muslim American community. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I thought this was uh, an amazing opportunity and it was only, it was quite ironic that, you know, it was going out in the world um, after, you know, Trump entered into office, uh, which now we see, you know, that the situation is um, even even more desperate and critical, in my opinion. Yes. Thank you. Stephanie, is hatred an underlying theme <laughs> in your work? I. Uh I would actually say love is, <laughs> but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly search, searching out love, uh, but it is increasingly difficult to find uh, in terms of the political landscape. I catalog life in the borderlands between uh, 2007 and 2017. Uh, that is just the time period in which I was researching this book. It was a 10 year project for me. Uh, so basically, I was researching throughout the Obama administration, and it was pretty horrifying, the many things that I found, um, everything from 
severe environmental injustices on both borders, uh, cancer clusters surrounding oil refineries and multinational corporations like GM, Reynolds, and Alcoa, um, you know, that are they're just entirely surrounding uh, communities of color and particularly indigenous uh, communities. Um, I was starting my reporting right when the Secure Border Fence Act went into, um, was realized and 670 miles of concrete and steel wall were implemented, um, cutting throughout the border, uh, which was dividing up people's homelands, um, making it impossible to cross um, as we've always crossed along the border. Um, always, we've always been you know, so many families uh, half live on one side, half live on the other, and now going to visit Eurythia, which should have just been a, a, a matter of crossing a bridge is now, are you still crossing the same bridge, but now it takes two hours and as opposed to two minutes to cross the bridge. Um, border death, which is what I referred to. Anyway, the situation was just catatonic when I was doing this reporting, and now it is just, um, I, I actually handed in my book uh, just a couple of weeks before uh, the election. Uh, the 2016 election and wow uh, my god what's happened since then um it is dystopian uh now we have more than six thousand children uh severed from their parents we don't know where their parents are now i mean just it, it, kids are living in detention centers alone being cared for by other kids uh the psychological impact of that the cruelty of that is really, really breathtaking. Um, so yes, the inhumanity uh, that one witnesses is is really stark now in the borderlands. Um, but there is still a lot of love that comes to the surface through the work of activists, through the work of artists, through the work of uh, faith keepers. Um, and so I, I am always in a process of trying to seek out that. I do see hope um, among the residents and, uh, but the border, the, 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 the policy, the political aspect of it is 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 quite the epitome of hatred. Yes. Amra, what role does hatred play in your account of your years? Um, yeah. This is an important question and I really appreciate you asking it. Um, I think when readers um, in the United States see the official description of my book, um, the cat I never named as the stunning memoir of a Muslim teen struggling to survive in the midst of Bosnian genocide and the stray cat who protected her family through it all. I think their first inclination may be to think that this is a story of war that happened to someone else in a distant place, in a different time, in a place where people hated each other for a very long time and that nothing like it could ever happen here in the United States. But I think once they start reading The Cat I Never Name, they will begin to see that I was very much like them. I didn't think the war could ever happen in my country in the same way that most Americans today think it cannot occur here in the US. Um, I was a math and physics nerd. Um, I was 16, I loved writing, I played volleyball, I had great friends and even started to fall in love with the boy. And then in an instant, it all changed and I suddenly found myself in an entirely different world, the world that I never imagined before. My country was torn apart, family members slaughtered and women and girls I grew up with raped, all because we as Bosnian Muslims stood in the way of racially pure nation, which the Serbs who were the dominant ethnic group in my old country wanted to build. And I think your audience members can draw the parallels between that context and what is happening in the United States today on their own. Um, I couldn't go to school on most days uh, for years, for nearly four years, which again, many teens and parents can now relate to. And even though many specifics or the stakeholders in what is happening in the United States are different, the sense of dramatic upheaval, the sense of fear, hatred, othering, racism, and uncertainty are exactly the same. So my book is not just a, a memoir, not just a book, but it's also my call to action to begin to counter hate through storytelling. Hatred is not exclusive to any one nation. 
any one group or any one person. And I'm just going to share a detail with you that a couple of days ago, I received an emotional note from an American pilot who served in Bosnia. He was deployed as part of NATO efforts to end war in Bosnia. And he said to me that he never cried while reading a book as much as he did cry while reading The Cat I Never Named. He recently retired and he said he was questioning what his purpose in life was. And The Cat I Never Named evoked the emotions and realization that really his purpose in life was saving my life and lives of people like me. And Bosnia represents one instance um, in terms of American foreign policy where humanitarian and intervention did make a difference and save lives. How do we overcome hatred in this country? How, how, uh, and feel free, any one of you, to answer that. Uh, Stephanie, how do we? Oof. Uh, I think that shared experience is is a, an important step. That's why I feel public schools, public transportation, public movies, festivals like this are so important. Uh, it's why I think that COVID could actually be a very powerful united shared experience. Um, if we we all kind of um, share the idea that we should be focusing on keeping each other safe. Um, rather than our own comfort level about wearing PPE, but we were just concerned about um, one another's safety and 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 health. Uh, so that's that's another reason why I always return to the artists of the community, the activists of the community, and the faith keepers of the community. I feel like they are working uh, deeply to to unite one another and to show, uh, expose, and celebrate uh, what we have in common uh that we are all one one people um and i think that climate change is going to uh show us that even more intensely and COVID is going to show us that even more intensely so i think that these are i mean these are tragedies that we're living through but i think they also have the uh, there's a the, op the optimist in me is hoping that that can be a possible uh way that we can understand that we are indeed sharing a same experience and that we are going to need all we're going to need all of um, everyone is going to need to unite in order to overcome all uh, these tremendous obstacles that are that are really rapidly hurtling our way. So I would say shared experience because shared experience gives us an opportunity to share stories. Shared stories give us an opportunity to see ourselves in one another, to feel one another, to realize that we are one. Sahar, so how do we uh, yeah. combat uh, Islamophobia? Um, th this, is, for me, is such a complicated question. I, I appreciate what Stephanie is saying about um, the role of the artist. I think uh, by writing, um, you know, I'm, I'm entering into like an act of empathy uh, by somebody picking up my book and engaging. That, too, is, is an empathetic act. Um, I, but, but I do think that, you know, th there is also a point where, um, you know, Fiction is is only going to do so much, and this this sort of responsibility and onus that is placed on uh, writers of color and then and then victims in in this society is just tremendous. So I I, I guess I would say that um, you know the the greater um, white community also needs to make an effort, right? And and it needs to be also beyond um, you know places like this and beyond art for sure. And I, I don't say that pessimistically. Um, I, I definitely feel optimism too. Uh, but again, that, that needs to be shared. You know, um, I, I think about, for example, this idea of assimilation and what a failed experiment, you know, it has been. And that's because it's, it's like a one way, um, you know, venture. So you are expected to come into, you know, um, what what is a colonized country, and you need to basically sever, you know, your 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 native culture, you know, your religious your religion, um, and and other various parts of of your identity. Uh, it's never well. You can bring that too, 
and and let's celebrate that too, right? And I really believe though, and, and this is the optimism that you know, fiction is definitely one way of expanding the narrative. Um, and and again, I'm so grateful to be in the space. Uh, but but I think um, you know, we we I, I love what Leila Lalami says in in her new book, um, Unconditional, or I'm sorry, Conditional Citizens conditional citizens. Her whole point is that if you aren't born in this country or if you are a person of color, if uh, you know you are constantly having to prove your patriotism. And she talks about this idea of uh, there being um, a garden of innocence <laughs> that you know some people in this country continue to live in and expect us to sort of lead them out of. So I would say education. So you know certainly I think um, we're we're all educators in some regard. I teach high school students um, too, and it you know literature has always been this wonderful um, window um, and mirror. You know the metaphor that we use, but yeah, I just think um, you know we can obviously do better, and that's going to come through. Uh, you know, recognize our uh, recognizing our bigotry and and educating our 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 young people much younger and not not be in this mindset of, but they're too young to talk about race. They're too young to talk about Islamophobia. Because guess what? Uh, the kids really are our future and they're actually more open to engaging if we would just give them space, you know, in time. Amra, you wrote uh, uh, your book for young adults. I wonder how difficult that was since you had such difficult subject matter to discuss? Um, I, would, um, I would say that for me, a simple response to, to really your, your question is that I was 16 when I was experiencing um, this visceral hatred. So it seemed natural and obvious to be writing um, in that voice. And it was, um, more than that, um, important to be honest on these subjects, as was already said. For instance, it was a couple of years ago that my third grader, my younger daughter, came uh, home from school and asked me a question. Mom, what will happen to Jana, her older sister, and me um, if you and dad are rounded up as Muslims or immigrants? So for her, it wasn't really a choice to think about these issues. Um, eh, or not. And as someone who survived the genocide and who appreciated the opportunity of being able to come to the United States, I thought of one particular moment that really triggered my desire to write the story as genuinely and honestly as I could. And it was a moment when I was first entering the United States in 1996. I was 16 when the war started. I survived genocide. I lost members of my family, people in my life that I loved were stolen from me. And there I was standing at 20 with few dollars in my pocket, with broken English, with broken heart, terrified of men in uniforms. I was afraid of all men in uniforms because that meant to me killing or rape. And as I approached the immigration window, uh, the immigration officer looked at my papers for a very long time. And after a while, he reached out and I was trembling. I was holding onto the counter of his window, expecting to really pass out and expecting to be told, go back to the country that you came from. You don't belong here. We don't want you here. How could they ever want someone like me? I had nothing to offer. And in that moment, he reached out with his hand saw me trembling, ready to pass out, touched the fingertips of my hand, gave me the passport, and he said, ma'am, welcome to the United States of America. I am sorry for what you had survived. You are safe now. That moment makes me want to cry every single time I tell that story. It makes me want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> because it represents the possibility of America that I want my children to grow up in. And I still believe I'm an eternal optimist. I'm a genocide survivor and look where I am, I'm here. 
So yes. I believe in the possibility of that America and our shared humanity and the purpose of writing this story, regardless of how hard it was emotionally for me, is that the cat I never named will make people, irrespective of their background, cry and want to be part of one people, one nation, one humanity, irrespective, again, of who they are and what their backgrounds are. And so I'm hopeful, as everybody else, I'm hopeful. I think we have a lot of problems, but I am deeply hopeful and hopeful for my children. And I hope that everyone who is listening to us conversing reads each one of our stories because they have very important lessons to offer to young adults and adults. Stephanie, what's the best thing about America? What is our best trait? What can you love the most? <laughs> yeah, well, I am speaking from, uh, I, I I'll, I'll speak from a moment as a, as, as a traveler. Um, I, I visited uh, over 50 countries. Uh, I lived in Moscow in the 90s. I lived in Beijing uh, at the end of the last millennium. Um, I've, I've, I've lived in Mexico. Um, I've, I've really traveled quite extensively in the former Soviet Union. Uh, so, um, so speaking from that vantage point of seeing countries uh, on the brink and seeing countries enduring very difficult moments in their own histories, um, what I have appreciated about the United States is the opportunity to be, for, 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 for many people to become sort of a self-actualized human being um, where there are so many obstacles to doing that in, in, in other nations. Um, or at least that was my impression when I was younger and traveling. Um, but I think that all of us really have to stop and, and, and that, 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 that's, that's certainly been part of the American dream is that we do have the opportunity to be a self-actualized human being here. Um, but it isn't an equal opportunity for us all, as we've certainly seen in the last year very viscerally. Um, and I'm, I'm as, as, a, as a professor, I'm really heartened to see how all of my students are talking about this. And I think that we are having this awakening of, of a consciousness that it has not been possible for Black Americans to become self-actualized with the same, um, you know, with the same electricity as, 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 as people who are passing for white or for Latinx or Asian. And so um, I, I do feel it is more possible in the United States than in a lot of other nations, but, um, but yes. So anyway, this is a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of natural beauty also. <laughs> that's so, true. The, the that's definitely true. The United States is, that's like an uncontroversial thing I can say. It's a pretty state. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Sahar, what, what gives you the most uh, uh, confidence in the United States? Um, I think I echo uh, what, what Stephanie said. Um, but I, I, and I, and I just want to emphasize, you know, having lived in Palestine, um, yeah, I won't lie, you know, coming through, um, O'Hare International Airport every time is such a relief with my American passport because um, it's pretty horrendous, you know, the the um, the occupation uh, which continues there. So I'm I'm grateful, and I think for me, um, having been born here, I had taken that for granted un uh, until uh, we we had moved there for a bit, and then we also had the privilege to come back. So. Um, I'm I'm definitely speaking from a lot of privilege. So I'm I'm grateful that um, America, at least before this administration, has always been open, you know, um, in in accepting immigrants and refugees. Uh, like Stephanie was saying, it's not always equitable and and equal. But for me, I you know it it, it symbolizes the future, right? Um, so many people um, want to forget the past. Uh, we know though that, that that can be very dangerous, but that that's another point. Uh, and that and that has always been, I think, a great thing when um, we consider how much better we can be. So I, I am definitely hopeful, you know, and I think, again, young people are are going to lead the way. You mentioned uh, earlier that um, the welcome 
to our country very often is a welcome, come on in, if you can be just like us now. <laughs> uh, how is that being torn down as an idea? Mm. Uh, well, I see it definitely just within my immediate communities. So for for all of the, um, uh, you know, aggression and tragedy of Islamophobia, which, you know, when you think about it, even the word is just so horrific, right? We create this word to describe, you know, a hatred, an, an unreasonable fear of, of a religion, um, which is, you know, just continues um, to blow my mind. But um, I'm finding, um, especially with my daughters who are now third generation uh, Muslim Palestinian Americans, that uh, they they are again more ready to accept one another's differences, to celebrate them, and and you know it's not always about sameness as much as again um, here's here's what you know I'm I'm bringing you know to to the experience of us you know living in in the same country in the same world. Uh, and and there there's just something so beautiful about that, and we we also see that uh, in terms of sexuality and gender. So uh, just as a teacher of 25 years, I can't tell you the marvelous things that I've seen, you know. Um, and and it, it has been an, you know, just just amazing. So um, I, I think you know, Diana, it's 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 better. Um, I think communities, um, you know. Uh, have sort of rallied, you know, around um, their cultures and their heritage, but sometimes that, you know, or that continues to come as a consequence because, you know, there's always this question of, but if you're doing this, if you're if you're speaking, you know, if you're not speaking English, if you are not raising the American flag, then you can't be American. But um, I, I do think there has definitely been more of a celebration. So for me, the melting pot um, is gone. You know that, that you know. Failed, failed paradigm. I, th I think we're, we're, we're definitely doing better for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to ask Stephanie, you write about um, those people who live in the between uh, along our, our borders. How, do, how does one live in two cultures? How do we live in two cultures? Oh, well, the uh, Aztecs actually had a word for this. Uh, it was called Nathantla. And that was how they described the sort of schizophrenic uh, situation in which they had to sort of catch to the Spanish uh, imperial coloniz colonization forces, um, but simultaneously, secretly, covertly, uh, they would be honoring their own ancestry. And so, so sort of like straddling those two worlds, um, and that 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 is an that is an effect its own space, um, and so a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of fronteriza, a lot of people who live in the borderlands really uh, have come to conceive of themselves as occupying this particular space, and this particular space over the years has become its own culture, its own fusion of a culture. Uh, which is which is a beautiful culture and a culture that that is in fact my own culture. So um, I'm I'm Tex-Mex, I and mean, that's really what that's what I eat, that's what I speak, that's what I you know the music I listen to, the literature that I write. Um, we have sort of created our own culture within, and um, you know hopefully trying to extract the best of each culture and 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 creating something entirely new. So. Um, that is that is sort of the best case scenario, uh, but um, and I think that that's 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 the spirit in which people approach it. Um, however, it's also incredibly challenging because just as the Aztecs were having to contend with this sort of occupying force, um, that is that's still the reality today. Um, so one reason why Tejanos, um, so it's sort of like the original um, one of one of the long lasting you know inhabitants of South Texas. Um, we, a lot of us don't speak Spanish very well, uh, is because we were punished for speaking Spanish. Um, you know, kids for, for 70 years in public education would have their mouths washed out with soap for speaking Spanish. And so, so, um, so, so the culture has been extracted. Um, and I guess living in the Nepantla is trying to, to, to fuse the two together. Sahar, you spoke of 
um, the way to uh, combat Islamophobia and other phobias of people um, as shared experiences. And I want to ask Amra, what shared experiences besides that first one with the with the uh, immigration officer? Mm -hmm. What shared experiences have been um, good experiences for you in this country? Um. Well, I'm going to start by saying that for me, even coming to America um, was in a way not the choice ever, as much as it was growing up a dream that I really thought as a Bosnian Muslim, I was even banned from dreaming. It was not um, present in my life as a possibility ever. And just to put it in the context for you and your audiences, uh, especially for those who may not be familiar with the brutality of the war in Bosnia and the Bosnian genocide, I was for almost four years living in my hometown of Bihać that was besieged and constantly bombed by the Serb army with no access to food, electricity, or normal schooling. I really felt, um, for all those years, that every day I was in a waiting line, waiting for my turn to be killed. And I used to go to bed hoping that I wouldn't end up being raped, that uh, my death would be quick and a result of an explosion. Um, and then there was a point in the war when um, something beautiful happened to me. Um, and then, and, and I won't go into details of that. Um, it is a detail obviously that is um, um, deliberately and extensively handled in the book. But in that moment, I learned probably one of the most important lessons in my life. And that was that I really couldn't control the forces external to me in the same way that teens today and even adults cannot control the pandemic and social unrest and Islamophobia that was already mentioned or rising hatred or violence um, in our country. But what I did know um, is that I could control what was internal to me and what it is that I do. And so that was the moment when I decided to really focus on as an individual who was deeply hated on self-empowerment and in some ways self-appreciation of things that I do. So I started learning. I um, taught myself English. I found an old dictionary that my father had when he was in college um, in our attic and memorized every word in that um, dictionary. I worked on immunizing children during the war. I won national math and physics competitions that ultimately helped me get here. And there was a moment um, during that time when a team from the International Rescue Committee uh, visited my destroyed city. Uh, IRC is an, a well-known American NGO. Um, and they met one of my teachers who said to them, look, we're all going to die here. You can't save us, but at least save this one kid, save Amra. And so I was asked to come and study in the US. And I have to say that my initial reaction was, laughter. I uh, just simply never imagined myself in this country um, as a, an even remote possibility. And um, I was convinced that I would die. So I gave the IRC team my entire documentation, my transcripts, my birth certificate, all the originals, because I didn't think any of that really mattered anymore. Um, they came to New York City and they presented at the IRC's board meeting, and there was a philanthropist who stood up, uh, who was a board member, his name is David Pincus, who said, is there one life I can save? And I ended up being that person. I ended up being that life that he saved. He was a Jewish philanthropist 
Aside from him, I was helped by sisters who ran Chestnut Hill College, which was the first college where I enrolled when I got to the United States. They knew I could barely speak English, so they helped me at that time. I was also helped by Quakers um, in my early years here in the United States. So I choose to believe um, in that kind of American spirit, despite all that is happening um, right now in this country. I do believe that there is goodness in most of us. And if we can share our stories and evoke collective empathy, I think we can, uh, we can bring our, our nation and our people together. And I think, as was already mentioned, we are to an extent failing, but I choose to believe that there is a possibility of that America I want to see. Sahar, um, your, your novel is an intersection between two fraught topics in America, Islamophobia and gun violence. What inspired you to put those two things together? Um, well, you know, as I said earlier, it was inspired by that, that real life shooting. But I think, you know, having Afaf um, as the principal of the school uh, comes very natural, you know, from my background being, being a teacher. Uh, but the kind of violence that um, I, I typically dread is actually a young person, you know, bringing a gun to school, you know, feeling so um, disenfranchised by, by um, their, their community of peers. Uh, but 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 that that's a different kind of violence for sure. So in this book, um, you know, the gun violence is just simply you know the the kind of violence that is it, that is inflicted because of of bigotry. Um, it certainly you know is going to speak to um, the gun lobby and again you know, just just failed policies um, in this country and uh, not just against. Uh, Muslim communities, but also um, going back to schools and for children. Uh, you know, we, we've just lost too many uh, young people and we've lost um, too many um, American citizens who gather in safe spaces, what they think are safe spaces, and then end up, you know, uh, becoming victims of massacres because of our recklessness when it comes to uh, gun control. So yeah, I think those um, those two things I think are just you know um, natural you know um, to to talk about to unravel um, in this book, um, and yeah, I think um, yeah, I think I think uh, hopefully that that answers the question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Stephanie, Stephanie, what role does gun violence play in the borderlands, and how is it different between the north and the south? Those borders, the northern border and the southern border? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the, the thank you so much, uh, Sahar, for, for talking about gun violence in the United States. So I'll use this as an opportunity to talk about gun violence in Mexico, um, which is extreme. And uh, it, it's primarily the trafficking of guns from the United States down into Mexico. Um, Mexico actually has very tight gun laws, but, um, but it's very easy to buy guns in the United States. And that is what has led to you know, over 100,000 Mexicans being murdered uh, over, over drugs uh, because the United States can't control its own drug problem. Uh, so our ridiculously lax laws in buying guns is directly leading to tremendous violence uh, in, other in other parts of the Americas. Um, in the Northern, uh, and, and the same thing in the United States is, and um, in the Mohawk nation of Akwesasne as well, um, the guns are trafficked from the United States into Canada. Uh, Canada has incredibly strict laws. Uh, in fact, Canada only had one major uh, school shooting. Um, it was at a university in Montreal, I believe. Uh, someone came in and screamed uh, some anti-feminist remarks and, and, and killed all the women who were in that particular classroom. This happened like more than 25 years ago, I mean, quite a long time ago. And immediately, China, I mean, uh, Canada made major sweeping gun, gun, gun rules 
Um, but so the, the violence that is occurring to the extent that there is like gun violence in Canada, it is from importing um, or not importing, but uh, there, there's a whole like trafficking of guns up as well. So I think that that is something really important to to see. It's not the United States are not only harming uh, one another, but also um, it's leading to a lot of violence in other countries as well. That has been more responsible about this issue. We have an audience uh, question for Amra. Hallie Henderson of a library service specialist at the Chattanooga Public Library. She says that she is currently reading your book. And she is so glad to hear even more of your story. She says, I like to hear the language in my mind while reading in an effort to connect more with the characters in the place. I would like to ask if you could please pronounce for me the very central word and sort of name, M-A-C-I, which means cat in the Bosnian language for those who may not have read your book yet. Thank you for that question. And um, another question that I often get is why is the book titled The Cat I Never Named? Then there's sort of a name in the story. <laughs> uh, Matsi means kitty in Bosnian. And just to provide some context, um, I encounter Meet Matsi for the first time as refugees um, start coming into my city just before my hometown of Bihać is besieged by the Serb army. And um, Mati refuses to sort of leave my family. She follows me home. And I have to be honest, and I'm very honest in the book about that as well. No one really wanted Mati in our household. My mom didn't want hair on the furniture. Um, my family didn't have enough food for ourselves, let alone another living being. I was attacked by a German shepherd when I was young, and I didn't like anything with the claws. Um, but Matsi just didn't care. She um, adopted herself and becomes a crucial char character in the story. And I'll just share um, uh, one detail. Um, there's a moment when um, on the very first day of bombing, June 12th, 1992, my brother and I um, decide as teens to be troublemakers and we leave the basement where we were locked up for, for a while to, um, to survive and be safe from the bombs. And we go back to our house to see Matsi and we see a couple of our friends who end up getting killed, blown up into pieces. And my brother and I survive because of Matsi. So there wouldn't be um, any story to tell, I wouldn't be here. The cat I never named would not have been written without Matsi. Um, and she continues to play a crucial role in our physical safety and our emotional um, and mental health really uh, throughout the entire war. And we simply called her Matsi. And one, mm -hmm. um, uh, one message or lesson that I wanted to communicate through the title of the book is that Sometimes, sometimes under these circumstances, um, when there is primacy of survival and desire to simply live day to day, one forgets to name a pet. Um, and it was only mm. retrospectively after the war that we realized that this living being that um, gave us so much love and hope during the war was never properly named. And so that's one of the reasons why I honor her with uh, being uh, one of the main characters in the book because that is um, that is the role that she played in our lives during the war. How wonderful. I want to thank all of you for being our guest today. Um, I am just totally smitten with with <laughs> each of the books and for for totally different reasons in each because they are not the same book. They're very, very different, but they certainly give us some insight into um, the immigrant experience in America and um, certainly give us hope. You have given us hope for uh, becoming better Americans and for uh, learning that all Americans are real Americans. <laughs> we thank you. We thank the Southern Festival. We thank our sponsors again, and 
we hope that we can all join each other next year in person. Mm. This has been a fabulous way to uh, enjoy the festival since we could not be there in person this year. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.